You know they got that same name with different point of views. Whichever one you choose, uh uh-uh, uh, you can't lose. They got that uh, same name, different point of views. Whichever one you choose, uh uh-uh, uh, you can't lose. Keisha and Keisha, man. Nice with them at discernment. Keisha you don't got it, you can get some if you hurt them. Keisha and Keisha, man. Knowledge, wisdom, and discernment. Uh, Keisha, you don't Keisha, got it, you can get some if you hurt them. We gon' last, have a good time. Just sit back and elevate your mind. Do a little bit something different tonight for episode 37. Okay. What are we gonna do different, Keith? We're gonna talk about this black girl magic or black lack thereof. Black girl magic. Is it taboo? I don't know. I. I with everything that's gone on recently with R. Kelly, everything that's gone on recently with just R. Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> um, everybody yeah. is so in, engulfed in trying to figure out um, if he did it or not. But you don't see a lot of support. <laughs> who, well, who's, but you don't who's see, confused? <laughs> you do not see a lot of, a lot of support for the women. And I know people have said that, you know, hey, um, I'm trying to figure out who confused. They don't believe he did it or not. I, okay, so let me say this. Let me I say th- it. I think that the woman who put, well, the group of people who put this on started, from what I understand, um, putting this together 2002 time frame. Mm-hmm. And just like anybody else, I think anybody could be, a, a molester or or a criminal or whatever the case may be. So just because he makes great music that make him make him a criminal. Okay. What you doing? You got it on your page. Oh, I was trying I'm sorry. to share it. No okay. problem. Go ahead. I'm All a, right. I just pick you up. <laughs> it I does. share I want to share it. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. You, you do it all the time. And Norman says I saw you can't fuck okay. Um and so I'm just want to discuss not R. Kelly but about the women. So we had some specific questions that we were trying to talk about. And as soon as you can kind of pull it together, let me know when you're ready. Oh, I'm ready. Okay. It's, it's your fault. What? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So question number one is, have we turned our backs on black, on women and black women today? So I really wanted to put a disclaimer up about this episode because it's not, and I've actually put it in the post, that we're not trying to not talk about um, women in general, but we wanted to focus in on black women specifically in lieu of what happened with R. Kelly. Okay. Yeah. So we want to make sure that we are discussing the topic, um, with, um, you got to turn that off. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 no. I, I just I thought. Just muted. There you go. All right. Can, can you keep it? talking. I, I don't know, know why I'm you t- stop Because I'm talking to you, and it's weird. Don't talk like, to me. Oh, talk to the oh, people. Oh, you don't want me talking to you? No, you're you're telling them I'm the disclaimer. One little piece of hair right here. And you know what my whole head will go gray. <laughs> <laughs> talk all right, to the people. Go ahead and tell them what the disclaimer is. Okay, so we, all right, so we want to be able to discuss um, how this affects black women. And so I kind of went down this rabbit hole. And anytime I do this, DJ has it like me, where we'll start on a topic, and then I start reading all this research on myths, um, on uh, just the treatment of black women from slavery on, and it just made me feel some kind of way. So I called Keisha. I was like, hey, we need to devote this episode to that. And I really wanted to, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm feeling kind of solemn about it because as I think about some of the stuff that happened with the people with the R. Kelly situation, I just feel like um, addressing this issue can be kind of sensitive, and I don't want anybody to think that we're trying to talk against any race, male, female, or anything, but we just wanted to focus in on the fact of that these black women and about the way black women have seen, been seen in America since the inception. And so it may be a little sensitive. Some people may want to take offense to it, but we hopefully that you won't, and you will just take the information that we're providing as an opportunity to say, hey, I hadn't thought about that. Maybe you can learn something. And we'll welcome any comments, but we just don't want you to think that um, we're going against anybody because that is not the case. They hadn't even said that. Don't give it to them. No, but But I I, want to interject and add something to it. It's a conversation that needs to be had. So at this point, I think that we are all grown people, and we should be able to have this conversation. And if you're offended, it might be something you might need to look into within yourself because at this point – um, I think we need to stop not 
walking around, dancing around the subject. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that I found out from this documentary, and somebody posted, y'all talking about R. Kelly, but why y'all ain't talking about your uncle so-and-so that's doing the same thing around the corner that we've been keeping a secret for, for 200 years. You, I mean, everybody's keeping it secret because mom and them don't want to hurt their sister feelings. Right. So, I mean, at this point, we need to stop being silent. We need to have an open dialect, and we mm -hmm. need to make it very comfortable mm -hmm. for girls to tell their story. Right. Yeah. And I think in the general sense, what African-American women is, we get into this, you'll see that it has not been something that's been easy to do for mm -hmm. a lot of different reasons. And so we're going to talk about those, and we would love to hear your views on that. But I really feel like that to open this up, we wanted to talk about the R. Kelly issue. So you said, who should have protected these girls from R. Kelly? And I, I said who should have because, I, and I know you are part of it and my other friends are part of uh, children advocacy, mm -hmm. who advocates for the kids. Right. And usually it's your parents. Yeah. You And I, I know for a fact that I advocate for my kids. Mm -hmm. I, I've, I listened to some of the stories because I didn't watch the show, but some of them, the parents dropped the kids off and kept going. My kids were in football, and I never dropped them off at mm -hmm. a practice, mm -hmm. at a game. And if I wasn't there, I had a designated person who knew what I wanted to happen right, right. for my child. Right. So I never, I just never felt the need that that responsibility fall on someone without me putting my input in it, because that person is my responsibility. So who advocates for your child it should be you. Right. But every parent is an advocate. Right. That's true. And that's what we're finding out. And when you think about it in the other aspect of this, it's almost like with all of the laws that are protecting children from pedophiles. And from neglect parents, neglectful parents. Right, that is yeah, true. I mean, to, yeah. I mean so. we talked about, you was talking about being a social worker and the kids who want to go with their parent mm -hmm. who's a drug addict, but the system says they're not equipped to take care of you. Right. So even the kid doesn't know what's best for them. Mm -hmm. The advocates got to know what's best for them. Correct. And um, and I think the biggest thing was, as you were, you didn't watch the videos, but as you're watching the videos, you see all these adults come up, not just the women who said they were victims, but people who... Who, knew. who supported, it, who, who went along with it, who may have turned their head but didn't stop it from happening. And I just feel like that should be a testament, and I'm hoping that it rang true to a number of people who may be in that position right now or know someone that is, and it's now time to step up because you're just as guilty. Well, I think in our community that I've found out in my own personal experience, no one else's, is that we tend to accept a lot. Mm -hmm. that go on with our girls and be like, but it's okay. No, it's not okay. It's not. Um, it was a young black man um, on my Facebook page. He was 21, and the girl that he was messing with was 15. White girl. Mm -hmm. And they going back and forth talking about how they had sex. You know how they do on the page because they want everybody to know because they what? ignorant. Her parents saw it and called the police yeah. and had him arrested. Good. And so the conversation on Facebook was it was consensual. Problem is, you can't have consensual sex with an underage. You cannot. With 15 I don't years care. old. If, you, if you're 15 and, or 16, you, it's not. It, I mean, the law says that now. And, and, it's and, not consensual. And that's the point I wanted black boys to understand. Right. Because, but the what I want to bring up, not just that, is that her parents brought charges as a white parent saying, no, you that's not right. Black parents would see that and be like, they might be mad, but they wouldn't bring charges. Mm -hmm. You see, You see the point I'm making? Mm -hmm. That it's like... My daughter had sex with her. It does not matter. Right. Because your daughter's not at, of the age to give consent. Right. And I, I heard other women say, but they went there and they wanted to have sex, regardless if they wanted to. He I'm knew a, it was illegal. And I'm going to tell you this. This actually happened. Um, I, will, I will just in a situation where someone was talking about the whole R. Kelly thing and a person walked in and they was like, those hoes, those bees, they deserve that and this and this and this. And I had to stop them and I was like, are you kidding me right now? You're trying to sit here and tell me it was okay that a 14 year old, Got regardless if on. her parents try to say it wasn't her, regardless if her old shady aunt tried to say she was, she didn't know what was going on, all this stuff happened and you're trying to tell me that you're going to call, really? That's, and you said this a few episodes ago about the reason why people don't come out, because who wants to be 
ridicule in that manner right. when you already hurting, yeah. when you've already been violated. Mm-hmm. So, um, and if you get the right attorneys and stuff, they will make that situation the way it is, where you now feel a ridicule. And it's crazy how blaming the, the women, victim. yeah, the, the victims get blamed so much, and you have that as your next one. Why is it okay to blame the victim? Like, and, and all why, and why, what you just said? Why did they think it was okay to call her a whore? What is he? Yeah. What is he? Yeah. Yeah. He's got multiple women yeah. and multiple children. Yeah. I mean, and then not only that, you've got a system that worked for him. Mm-hmm. He had his system well or yeah. as oh, far definitely. as I, I, mean, but you I, are I knew. calculated when you are a pedophile or when, I mean, we all have watched on them days where you're sick or you just ain't got nothing to watch all those cop shows and stuff that come on. These people are cold and calculated. And I'm like, at some point you got to really one calculation. calculation. And, and I tell they my kids that, that they are nice because people tell you, you be aware of a monster. You think well, about monster that she because was like, R. Kelly, R. Kelly was is a, nice, but Robert is, is the a devil. monster. <laughs> but, but this is the thing we had to teach our kids that the monster smiles. Yeah. That the monster has candy, that the monster offer you things. Yeah. All right, so in in trying to pull this all together, the Mm. last point you made was that how do we justify R. Kelly's behavior by calling all the stuff he's doing out and how he's getting away with it, but then we want to talk about comparing him to Harry Wines. Well, no, no, what I was saying is some people are saying, but what about Harvey Weinstein? I don't, we're not talking about Harvey Weinstein. Mm -hmm. Let's give R. Kelly R. Kelly's mess. And, and, and some of them saying, why are we talking about R. Kelly and we're not talking about the white people? Yeah. We're, see, this is where our black girls get lost. Yeah. Because you want to talk about the white people. Yeah. And we're, we're talking about the black girls that got violated in the community that allowed it. Yeah. And the monster who wanted it. Yeah. Well, I want to say again, I hope you read um, our post up there that says that we are not trying to offend. We have to use these terms, white and black and different things like that, because the way our society is created and how we 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 speak of things. But we really want to draw some issue to some of the things that are related to African-American women and how how we're being seen in America. So let's start off. Well, and that brings us back to the point that some of them were saying that R. Kelly was able to get away with this for so long because it was black girls. Mm -hmm. And the community Mm -hmm. really did um, not fight for the girls. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to first talk about the code of silence. And in the research that I've done, the code of silence was kind of established during slavery times. And what happened was racism trumped sexism. Okay, so there was this code of silence that was that is basically where you protected at all costs, uh, all costs. I'm sorry, the black man because of all of the things he was going through, even if he was abusing you. So when you think about how many people have protected R. Kelly through all of this, it goes right along with this code of silence. Um, one of the girls who ended up being a victim was somebody who stood outside his trial. She was a freshman in high school and would skip school every day to go and watch his trial. And then he ended up taking her virginity at 15, 16 years old. Um, and so they're and, that's, and according to everybody, that's her fault. <laughs> when a grown man wants to have sex with a, a teenager. Right. No, and it's not her fault. So what they were saying was basically that as young girls, black women are socialized to suffer the vent of some black men's rage, which resulted in their living in a hostile and a racist environment. So the so that black men have to deal with the hostility and the racism. Women kind of just say, okay, they kind of shrek off his uh, abuse, be it sexual or physical or whatever, because he has to deal with, quote unquote, the man. And so as a, it's like a double jeopardy for black women because it's like you know that it's not right you know that you're feeling some kind of way about it but you can't openly talk about it because then it will be going against the idea that you're trying to be supportive of of black men because of the plight of them in america and And it's uh and it's going against the idea that you have a voice and anybody wants to listen to you well it, it goes against that because that's another reason why black women don't come out because of the fact that most people want us to shut up and sit down Right, as women, and then and, we're going to talk about and that. And they that don't want to expose yeah. the, the ugliness. Right. So. so then when we add to the fact that we have this whole code of silence. So during slavery times, it was expected that white black women were to work alongside black men. So they were out in the fields all day long, picking cotton, doing whatever they needed to do. But they actually suffered even worse because they would either work as concubines, 
They would serve as whores, as wet nurses, as breeders. And so you had black women slaves that didn't have any relief all the way around. So they would go out and work and expect it to bring in and work just as productive as any other white a uh, black man, mm -hmm. and, then, and then had to come in while they're trying to get rest at night or trying to do whatever. They're the wet nurse for the white woman who didn't want to feed her children, or they're the the whore or the or or, or for you know whatever man that the white. I, I know I know we want to call them whore, okay, but I, I, okay, I'm I gonna say rape. Okay, because so I, I don't I, think I they didn't. wanted to have right, sex with right. none of them. Well, you're right. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I mean, the reason I say it is because Hollywood has made this a fantasy that Massa yeah. fell in love, love yeah. with this stuff. No, it was rape. And some of the stories I had heard, these girls were 13 and 14 right. having Massa's baby and other white men baby and, and black men this, babies. I sat in a room with some other educators and we were talking about a story and the way it was depicted was that this like you said this white master was, was in love with this woman and he wanted this and wanted that and when I say my I was just my blood was <laughs> curling in on the inside because and it's sad because I don't think that they were trying to be offensive to me, the women were there, but they were so convinced that that's what it was. They were like, well, no, how can you say that? Like, he really did love her. He re Do you understand she was a slave? She had She no couldn't option. tell him no. She had no So option. she had to go out and work alongside the men, work just as hard, mm -hmm. and then come back and be abused by this man who you said love her. Like, to me, none of that seems to But work. that's the story that Hollywood tells us. And when you start reading, reading real interesting um, stories mm -hmm. of our history, you realize that um, slavery was not romanticized right. at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, Hollywood has romanticized it, and the brunt of it all was black women. And that you hear a lot about black men getting beat, but think about being raped repeatedly. After you were beat. Like, and, and, still just, got, and still got to <sighs> be with this man and deal with yeah. his wife and right. his children right. and right. and work. Because it was like already bad enough working like an animal and being dehumanized. But then on top of that, they took advantage of you and then made you seem like you loved it. You know, so that was just, and it all became. And there was no protector. The right. black men could okay. not even protect you. And half the time when they were, the black men were raping the black women, the, the white masters would think that was cool because that was like inbreeding. You're going to actually create more slaves for us. So, yeah, this is what you want to do. Is she shouldn't have a say. Just take it. And so well, she didn't have. A well, say. you're right. And so due to the, the legacy, the how legal slavery was at one point, black women have never had the privilege of being submissive or docile or fragile. We've all I mean, rarely have they the feministic characteristics that's been attributed to white women or to women have also been attributed to black women. And if you really think about it, have it not. never has. No, it's, and it's it, like, you know, it's one of those things where I feel like. I, I really understand now, after reading these things, some of, as we're going to talk about, some of the other ways that people have shown, because it's gone on for, for history after history, and nobody ever wants to talk about it because it is horrible. Because if you had to really think about a woman, my and, that's, and I've always told you this, I, I don't even, it, it almost irks, I mean, like, I, I can't even explain the words for it if I had to go back, and I don't even want to know my history to a certain extent. I know eventually it's going to be something I'm going to explore, but if I read a story and find out some horrible things happened to one of my great great I mean, like, that's going to do something to me, because I just feel like at that point, I mean, you know, I don't know. I, I, I know I'm going to be the flip side. I'm going to be devil's advocate. First of all, that we've always been in survival mode. Right. That's the part. We've always had to survive. We've never been able to just live. Mm -hmm. We've always had to fight and struggle for anything mm -hmm. that we've gotten. Nobody's given us anything. And then the other part is to go back and look in our history and to see the struggles that our ancestors had, it makes me proud. Yeah. Because if they had not struggled, mm -hmm. I would not be here. If they decided to say, I give up. Because yeah. I'm thinking, how much could I have taken back then? I don't yeah. know. I'm thinking, I, uh, yeah. I don't, I'm thinking my ancestors wouldn't have made it mm -hmm. if they were waiting on me. But the problem is, is that the struggle is real the struggle for um, it happened it, it happened. well and, and that's then, the thing that i think a lot of people that don't is continuing discuss. within the community right but because in a different we're not way. Right. because we're not speaking Correct. about it because we're not educating ourselves about it and because the thing that happened with r kelly is something that we allow to happen to our girls right our right. black and brown girls right 
Right. And so when we when we talk about this, we would love to In hear your democracy. comments. But we just wanted to, as two black women, to be able to discuss this. And I just feel like, you know, and I, I mean this in the most sincere way. You know, I've loved and have great girlfriends that are of all races, all colors. And um, I just feel like this needed to be said, not only for me, but for my girlfriends that don't look like me so that they can get an understanding of it. Because I know they know about it, but the problem is, is almost like when Trump says, make America great again. First, we had to make it great. great. For us. And so it's one of those <laughs> things where you want to ignore or you want to make mm. marginalize things to make it seem like it wasn't as bad or whatever. But let's just have a real conversation about it. We can, I mean, Jim Crow wasn't so long ago. Yeah. Okay, Charlotte so, so let me wasn't tell you. so long ago. I don't know if you've <laughs> ever heard this story, but it's a, a man mm. named James Marion Sims. And I want to make sure I repeat that. James Marion Sims. He has been pioneered for developing tools and surgical techniques related to women's reproductive health. Okay? And so he is credited as the father of modern gynecology. So women, you know, when we go we go to gynecology visit, you know they take the little, put you in the stirrups and take the little clamp. Uh, it's, it's a clamp. No, it's called, it's, it's, it's got a word for it, and I keep, I, I thought I had put it down in here. It's like a skep, step, scapula or something to that degree. Well, he, cre oh, a speculum. There it goes, right there. Mm, uh, so he created the speculum, and a speculum is where they kind of dilate you so they can check your cervix and do all that kind of stuff. Well, he perfected this by conducting mm, tests on, on enslaved black women. women without any anesthesia and no medical ethics. So there were at least seven or eight women that had died. That's out of documented. Shock. That's document. That's yeah. documented. And look them up, James Marion Simps. They died of a shock because the pain was so intense. And this man had the nerve to say that that they were inhuman and they didn't feel pain like white women. So it was okay <laughs> for him to do that. Now, during that time, let's be let's be real. They didn't want to examine or treat any female or any female organs, because as you know, we've always been a male-dominant society. But particularly for this, he killed all of these black women, and, and for what I've read, at least eight died of shock because of the pain that they had to endure because he wanted to be the father of modern science. Gynecology. Um, it's going back to what you said about women that he was saying that they didn't, they didn't have any pain. It's going back to what they felt about black women, enslaved black women, that mm -hmm. we had no value. He didn't value their no. lives and um, testing on women. Enslaved women. So um, he basically built an eight person hospital in the heart of a slave trade district in Montgomery, Alabama now. Cha. For people who are down here with us, do you know how close that is? So this happened in Montgomery, mm. Alabama at a, at a slave trading district. And he had an eight-person hospital, and he would allow them to bring the slave. Because what happened was to inbreed and, to and, and you know, the, the slave owners would bring these women to them if they had issues or problems. It was like one thing that was really common among them, and I, I can't um, put my eyes on it right now. But there was, like, um, a real common, like, something that was going on and he wanted to try to cure it because then that was getting in the way of the women being productive, being mm -hmm. able to reproduce. So he did this and had this eight person hospital in the heart of the slave trade district in Montgomery, Alabama and took these women. And I'm not, uh, let me, let me stop. Some of these girls were eight, nine, 10, 11 years old. So they weren't even older. They weren't old enough for Girl, gynecological like exams, think. but um, we <sighs> got modern medicine. It is so sad. It is so sad. So we wanted to honestly bring this to the forefront as we're talking about R. Kelly, as we're talking about the, the fact that so many people are so angry with these girls, and they're so upset with um, the fact that they did this, this this documentary and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, because Step in the Name of Love, they don't want to take out a day rotation <laughs> in their um, – in, the, in their playlist what? or whatever the case may be, or they don't want to accept the realization that this guy has a problem and the things he's done to these girls. But we wanted to share with you how this has been a problem in America among black women for centuries since the beginning. Black girls, yeah. So we're going to talk real quick about a few women in our culture that actually did some great things. Um, Ida B. Wells Barnett, she was a journalist. Mm -hmm. She put together the um, alpha, alpha Suffrage Women's Right to Vote. Mm -hmm. And um, it was during a time when black men were saying, hey, y'all need to just be 
housewives and mothers and leave the male dominated world of politics to men. Well, we want to thank God that didn't happen because guess what's at the House of Representatives right now? Black women, people Black of color. Black women, 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 and women. What is it in Montgomery where that one um, district have all those women who are judges and stuff? Remember that picture? Mm, yeah, but I don't you know. know oh, no, I think it was in Texas. Yeah. Okay, okay. it would have been kind of cool if it was in Montgomery right down where that slave trade was. But, okay. <laughs> you know, I'm just <laughs> I'm just saying. All right. And then they you got still in Jim Crow. In Mary Lou Hamer. And in the summer of 1962, she um, joined the Student Nonviolent Coordination Fanny. Committee. Fanny. Fanny, I'm sorry. I keep. And um, she went down and was one of the folk, folk people who got the right to vote. Yeah. And they basically put her, she was a sharecropper, and they put her off, fired her from her job, and driven her away from her plantation. And she made a comment, and I wanted to say that she says, They kicked me off the plantation, they set me free. It's the best thing that could have ever happened to me. She now says, I can, now work I can work for my, my people, okay? Amen. And then the last one is Sojourner Truth. And Sojourner Truth was the one who, in 1851, spoke at the women's conference when the women was trying suffrage. to suffer. Yeah. They were trying to get the right to vote. And she uh, said, ain't you know, I, said, I know you want to do that, okay. <laughs> ain't I black? Yeah. And she talked about the fact that um, women of color didn't have, was not recognized with digni dignity, respect, and equal justice. And she wanted it for all women, but she focused on the fact that it was definitely not for women because of the things that happened with slavery. So, mm. all right, so we want to talk a little bit like how it got to be like this. So these people did this study and they were like, okay, so are black women really invisible? Like, what is the deal with it? What makes <laughs> them say that they're invisible or whatever? And so they did this experiment and they took these pictures and they gave you these categories. They said you can be, choose if they're black or white, if they're male or female, and they had to respond pretty quickly, okay? And so the picture would come up and they would respond. The slowest response was happening with the women of color. Like they didn't know if they wanted to put them in the black category or in the women category. And so when the black men came up, instantly black. When the white, white men came up, instantly male. When the white women came up, came up women. But they didn't have a category to, to put the black women in, so it was a slower thing. The other thing was is that they realized that they played these tapes and um, they had people of black, white, male, and female. And the black women's voices were the ones that they didn't remember. They didn't remember what they said. They couldn't remember if they were in the room or not. We're and invisible, <laughs> huh? Until you need something. And so they started talking about the fact that mm. it was what you call a non-prototype. Like we don't have a type. Like when you think of black, you think of males, black males. When you think of white, you think of white males. When you think of women, you, you think, think of, of white, white women. women. But when you 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 think of black women, we have a double entendre. We're in a minority, and we're women. So we got yeah. like a double double uh, minority to us. And so they don't know where to put us. So what they do is marginalize us. And if you don't want know what marginalize means, that's basically make you unimportant. Okay? Invisible. And then they get upset when we want our voice heard. Imagine that. Okay. <laughs> and they imagine because we speak loud. Oh. oh, my God, I'm so afraid of you. Well, so either you, yeah. either, either you speak loud or your own meaning people who are, are also black see you as uppity. So if you're a black woman who wants to speak out, who has gotten an education, who has done some things that you want to, you know, you want to be recognized for, they call you uppity. And, and crazy is uppity was actually an oppressive term by white supremacists who says those were blacks who were trying to... To educate themselves. Yeah, to, to gain... To learn stuff and to actually... Yeah, who if you had economic... And you or a to political wealth over them, they were like, oh, use one of them uppity. uppity. And so we started. Yes. I see it for you. Okay, so black folks started doing that to women. So if women got overeducated, not overeducated, if you got educated, if you made more money, if they, they just automatically saw you as being uppity. Now, here's what's even crazier when we think about how much we sell in records and films and media. In film and media, they see it as over-sexualized. Every time you see a black girl in a movie, um, just recently we've gotten more black women that have taken on black roles, but they always make them sexy or overly sexy, okay? When, uh, what was that, the one show where she took off the wig, the primetime TV, uh, what's her name? Viola Davis. Viola Davis. Oh, honey, oh my God. About. They went crazy about that because it was like she wasn't seen as the sex symbol that didn't. You know who went up. crazy? My cousin. I can't believe they didn't. Female, black female. She yeah. felt like it was uh, 
she felt like it was negative, and I thought it was so empowering. Right. Because um, one of what they did on um, how to get away with murder, I thought they had too much makeup on her. Right. And too much. Remember, I kept yeah. saying, "Oh and my God, what did they do?" She was like, and then when all they did that, so they could do the reveal of yeah. taking all the lashes and yeah. everything off, yeah. and the hair, hair, and I, oh, now I get it. And she's down to her bare natural yeah. self and um i understood but they but they self-imposed that even but, on us because, but you let me know say who this. was upset black women i get it but listen they were mad. we imposed that on ourselves there are women i don't know if you saw um what's the one um nappy uh, uh nappy lee ever after yeah yeah how she would get up and put on a full face and do all this kind of stuff because she didn't want her dude to see her in her natural beauty now most women may not go that far, but there are a lot of us. Sonny Hostin does. She okay. said it on The View. She said she get up, she sleep in makeup. See. She don't want her husband, her husband of 20 plus years. And honestly, I find that so disturbing because. It is I, disturbing. I, I'm going to tell you why I find that disturbing is because I feel like your husband should, should yes. be the person that see you naturally. I'm talking about All the makeup naked. and hair should be for the public. Look, but privately, with the little, with the little excess. Me. Fat around your tummy. No, to but that's what I'm saying. Your Probably thighs, whatever. Be, they should be able to see that. But that we even feel away. How many of us will grab a towel? Or now dudes will walk around bucket naked and be like, what up, babe? But and then they you, look you go to do that and you be, you be trying to find something to cover up to do whatever. Unless you done went out and got some perfect body or, you know, got a little nip and tuck even here. Even girls with perfect bodies. And I'm not bodies, trying to encourage you. Even folks. girls with perfect bodies think something's wrong with yeah. them. Yeah. And it's I'm so not trying disturbing. to discourage anybody from it's working so out or doing anything like that. I mean, we all need to stay healthy but it's like the fact fact <laughs> except for Keisha <laughs> but the fact that so many women will go to that length to mm -hmm. not even to the person they in love with but here's what's crazy most guys don't care don't care most guys don't care i mean guys i need to hear from <laughs> y'all do y'all so really care they'd I mean, be so woman, happy to have a female that don't care <laughs> but i'm just saying the woman you love what? your wife your girlfriend or whatever if they're right there with you do you would you care if they got up and put on a full i mean looking like they look at first thing in the morning does that really bother you or do you find beauty in that and that's the part that gets me because i think so many women don't realize that they do find beauty in that i do and a true story, my, 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 my son even said to me, he was like, if you got to put on a whole bunch of makeup to look good, I ain't got time for you anyway. Mm. I was like, I raised that boy, right? Mm. You go, DJ Thomas. Yeah, I'm okay, you, so, so not only in film, but then the vulgar depiction of black women in the lyrics of rap music. Look at how, oh, oh my we, God. I mean, but you missed a step, the, un, <sighs> the unintelligent black woman. The one that they put in oh, all yeah. that that we're stupid and that we're mm -hmm. you know and and have us loud and right. Blah, 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 right, 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 and right, it's right. like I don't know nobody like that yeah. except me and Tiffany had it. <laughs> <laughs> You and Tiffany need to sit down Me and somewhere. Tiffany, everybody else, ain't nobody else like that. But the misogynistic <laughs> views that rap music take, and it's gotten so bad. And I'm like, we allow our kids when they're younger to listen to it. Because I get, you can't do nothing about it as they get older. Yeah. But if you're not speaking against it, um, I remember having a, a, a real conversation maybe about five or six years ago, and maybe some of those guys might be tuning in right now. But the guys used to always come into my room, and they'd sit on my couch and talk about all the girls from my step team and stuff they even been with and I'd be sitting there like I'm gonna punch one of them in the face but um mm. they started talking about it and we started talking about the music and I said why do you don't think that that the b word is offensive or why do you don't think that when you say whore when you say that is offensive and I say listen to the music so we played a few songs and I said y'all listen to this all day long that you become so desensitized to it that it doesn't affect you anymore so when you call a, a girl a b or when you being disrespectful to her you hear it all day long so then the respect level that you would have for her feels odd it feels weird when you really find somebody who you like and, and adore and you want to put her in that space you don't even know how to do that because you're so busy trying to you know listen to music where they dehumanizing them well I, what are they I, emasculating? I, I, mean, not I have uh, one rule misogynistic yeah oh, yeah I have one rule to my kids it's okay. entertainment it's entertainment don't take this music thing and make it your reality no no, no no I'm saying because some people think that because they're out there calling women be bitches and whores and all this stuff that that's what they are and I said no they're out there trying to entertain you no but here's what I'm no. saying to that the only reason why I do not agree with that perspective not that there's not entertainment but the fact that it's, it's like right now 
for as much as Trump rolls around and talks about fake news and talking about CNN and doing all kind of stuff, you hear that all over the place. Like, it is like the dog whisper. I think the music does the same thing. These boys listen to this stuff day in, day out. They work out and listen to it. They go to sleep and listen to it. They play the game and listen to it. And it's constant something. So it's not that they are purposely trying to go, ooh, what exactly are they saying? This is what I want to talk about, this girl or whatever. But they hear it so much to where it doesn't bother them. It's, it's like anything Trump you do. Is an entertainment. He is the president of the United States. That's not the point. That's not the point I was making. Okay. He supposed we're gonna to move be on not past entertaining Trump. us, but giving us the actual. All right, we're getting back to the, to the deal. So we're gonna Go talk ahead. about some stereotypical myths and realities of black women. Myth number one: Black women are highly sought out after in the job market because they are two first. They're women and they're minority. And so companies are anxious to hire them to fulfill affirmation action. Quotas. That's a damn lie. And, and that's so, me because I've been out in the job market and I'm a twofer, twofer not getting a job. <laughs> All right. So they says here, many companies are still reluctant to give black women positions with prestige and high visibility because they are not convinced that these women have the skill, the leadership ability, and drive to perform competency in executive positions. There was an actual guy... Um, Harvard, he was on the administration for Harvard, and he stepped down because they would not hire a woman for the job because they said that to him. Well, I'm going to tell you, as a black woman, woman in the profession, um, I had a colleague, um, you know, they hired me on this job to do this job, so mm -hmm. you know I knew how to do it. <laughs> but she said, you are really smart. <laughs> I said, I just looked at her like. Mm, okay. Well, myth number two. <laughs> no, no, no. And going back to that, um, uh, did y'all watch New Amsterdam? Well, um, it's this, it's this new TV show of this guy coming in to run this hospital, and he hires the black guy to um, run the cardiology position and the black guy start hiring all these black females mm -hmm. and he goes what are you doing what's going on you know all everybody you know they're looking like all of them are black all of them are female and he actually that's the point he made that these women don't get the chance don't get the chance. and he's in a position to put them on and that's what he's gonna do he said mm -hmm. they have these degrees they learned they've got all this but they don't get the chance don't to the even chance. operate in their field because of what you're saying that they some people think they're not competent enough right and he said every one of the females that he hired fit the qualification mm. so it wasn't but it, it looked real different to see a bunch of black women mm -hmm. at one point but he was in the position that we're going to talk about later of putting someone on right. the gatekeeper but go so ahead. myth number two black women who graduate from prestigious ivy league professional schools have greater access to employment opportunities um, a lie myth for black people in general um, the White formalized credential process alone has never been enough to ensure employment. Like they just don't want to believe we it. Have, uh, we are amongst the most educated mm -hmm. now in America is black women. Mm -hmm. We have gotten out there and gotten all these degrees. And we're still underpaid. Well, because we can't, we ain't, they ain't got enough students. They ain't getting married. Okay. No, well, right, no. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Let's, let's go. Okay. Uh, no, no I'm saying three. we're still underpaid right. with all these degrees. We're going to talk I about that. At, yeah. Uh, Michelle Obama having a degree from Princeton mm -hmm. and Harvard mm -hmm. and it's talking about what she was making back then. Girl, did you almost cry? Because I think she was making, she went down to making 60000 well, no, a she, year. She, she took she, a different job. Yeah, but I'm just yeah. saying, though, even with both degrees. She was at the, she was at the top for that career. Yeah, field, which though. was 60000 yeah. But that was yeah. for anybody. No, but I, I get that. But I'm saying that she had two prestigious degrees, and right, we're, she started we're talking about for a law the fact, reform, yeah, yeah, like but, making a hundred something. But that's but what yes, I'm you're right. I get you. And she All still right. was making less than the, her colleagues, yeah. which she brought up. She was making a lot less than them. So, black women who have established themselves in their career fields do not need to be concerned about the influence of the gatekeeper. Now, I don't know if y'all ever heard about the gatekeeper, y'all, but we're going to tell y'all about this gatekeeper. Mm. You kind of knew it. I guess you didn't. Maybe Like for me, I didn't really know the term in that regard. So let me tell you a little bit about it. So the notion of gatekeeper takes on a different meaning for black people in racist and sexist societies. Gatekeeper is a phenomenon experienced by both black women and men. As long as there are issues considered around fit and comfort for white working with blacks, there will be a need for a gatekeeper. So, again, comfort for whites who have to work with blacks. A gatekeeper in this context is a minority person who has reached the upper ranks in his or her field, but who typically started his career as a token. 
Um, this is why I don't pan out on most jobs because okay. I ain't the one. All right, let me finish. <laughs> the gatekeeper has proven beyond a doubt to the white powers that he or she is trustworthy, reliable, and non-threatening. So let me say this to to what I've said before. Um, last year, the year before last, when I had a job, and the white people were so threatened by me. And I could not understand. And what and the thing that didn't I didn't get is they want me to make them feel comfortable while they made me feel uncomfortable. Okay, so let me finish with the gatekeeper. The black gatekeeper provides information and opinions to whites as to whether a junior minority is depend is a dependable person who won't cause any embarrassment or make any unnecessary waves uh, waves about racism. <laughs> Well, that wasn't me, cause them they well, was they, they wanted me out of there. Okay. Well, let me wait. Hold on. He or she or starts the interest to membership in an exclusive, often elite group, and helps to determine, okay, <laughs> or grant or whatever, who will be let through to the next level. And see, that wasn't me either. I didn't want to be granted Girl. or let through your next level. But it's it, just a point, like. No. This is so crazy, and I, I get it because I've seen this. I told you a few years ago I had a black woman that would not even speak to me because she was so afraid that the white people were going to think we were friends. That's and crazy. And she had just got them to start speaking back to her because they had gave her the cold shoulder. And she had been working for them 10 years. And I was like, child, I ain't got time for this. <laughs> I mean, I can't even. This is so stupid. But it's for, this is true because um, I've worked with people who want to be Trump supporters and want me to be a, to go, I'm not going to say nothing because I'm not a Trump supporter, but I let them have their conversation Mm -hmm. and I don't let them have their conversation. Mm -hmm. My thing is, um, I I sit there and go, no, you're not going to have your conversation with me uh, and you're not going to be comfortable. So if you bring that up, you go, you will Feelings gonna get hurt. But here's the deal that gets me. It's like a lot of times you will find where the gatekeeper, this this mm-hmm. black person, will feel like they need to do this. Oh, I know. I mean, they will be convinced by individuals that they need to be this gatekeeper. Oh, you're gonna tell us who we who won't be an embarrassment to us, won't call any racial waves, and who we can trust to let in. And then they they make it. I mean, they are so like tied into being this gatekeeper that they were like, hey, if you don't do this, then they're not going to look at me this way and they're not going to do whatever. Okay, well, what's wrong with you just being smart enough to do your job? What's wrong with you just having the ability to do your job? Why do you feel like, A, you have to be a gatekeeper, number one, and B, why is it that such an honor? (laughs) I don't get that. It's not. It's not I went to the honor. same. I, it's I, a I, disgrace. I got the same degree you have. I have the same number of years that you have. But because you are a different color than me, now I need a gatekeeper to, for you to, to find it's out if I'm going to be disgusting. trustworthy and can do my job. You know what's really disgusting, Keisha? Please. And yes. because I, you know, I'm in the private sector, is I have a lot of people that work with me that have no formal training, no degrees, and don't even know how to conduct a meeting. And you sit there with them and you go, wow, Um, you sitting here and possibly making more money than me. And you don't even know how to conduct yourself in a, you're not professional. Mm -hmm. And then you, you turn around and you go, but the, the black person in the room in the room have all these degrees Mm -hmm. just to be considered as semi qualified or as the lady said, you really are smart. Right. And then here's the deal, like one of our friends, um, he says that. He says he will be conducting a meeting. Highly educated engineer, make the money, has the position, has teams. And he walks into I the like room, this friend. and they still <laughs> don't think he's the man in charge. True. And he was like, so what is it I got to do? I, I went to the same, uh, because of his skin color, because he's a black man. That I'm going to so say this crazy. to you. So my, like, my, my job that I'm at now, I'm the only black person there. Not the only female, but the only black. And so I park at a certain position, and one, and the white guy said, "How did you get? How are you able to park here and nobody else can?" Like, and I said, "I just drive my car up and park." <laughs> 
<laughs> and he was, but he was saying it like, really? Yeah, yeah. He's what is your, and what mm -hmm. do you do? And, it, and I'm an accountant, so a lot of people don't understand mm -hmm. what I do. Mm -hmm. And so they always like, what is she doing? Right. What is she? Let me tell you, when I used to manage um, a department store, and I'm not going to say the name, but I was there one time, and a guy who was working for the company had to come in and do some work. And so he came in and um, he says, well, I need to speak to the manager, blah, 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 blah. And I wasn't up front. So the girl goes and gets me. I come back. I said, well, who's looking for me? And then he goes, I don't know who's looking for you. I'm looking for the vendor. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, well, we'll wait on her. <laughs> and I went on about doing my work or whatever the case may be. And so then he went back to the girl and was like, I'm waiting on the manager. And this is just unprofessional that I have to wait this long for this manager. Why? Sh what, what's, what's the problem? Blah, blah, blah. He goes, you've already met the manager. So then I walked back up and I says, well, how can I help you? He was like, I don't think you can help me because I'm waiting on the manager. I said, okay. <laughs> so I walked away and did it. Now, this is going into an hour. And I see him over there and he getting irate. He didn't been on his phone, did everything. But every time I approached, approached him, he didn't, he didn't want to accept the fact that I was the manager. So I was going to let him just wait. So then he, he went back to her again. And this time he's living and he going in and blah, blah, blah. And she goes, you've met her twice. What do you want me to do? She's standing right over there. And he looked over there, right over where? Right there. And then I looked up and I did my little hand like that. And he was like, and I was like, yeah, that's why you've been here an hour. Because for whatever reason, I guess he just didn't think I was the manager. Again, I'm invisible. Invisible. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> All right. So the last myth is successful black women are arrogant, hard, controlling, self-centered, and uppity. If you got some intelligence, as a black woman. Now, do they classify anybody else like that? Have you no, ever heard them talk no. about any other? Do they talk about educated white women like that? Do they say that they are arrogant and hard and controlling we and self-centered? <laughs> I'm sorry. But no, get back to the fact I have been called a few of those things on that list. And not because I'm any of that. I mean, if I was of the man doing what we're supposed right. to do, it would be like, oh, that man is on it. He's got his job under control. But as a female mm. who knows her position but and knows how to get the job done, mm -hmm. I, girl, I've had to go snap off on, and it was a police officer mm -hmm. at the time. We're doing drug testing. And he goes, he's not going to take the drug test. Oh, oh good. Okay. <laughs> that what I said. <laughs> well, but my point is, is said, that you turn your the stuff arrogant, in. the hard, the controlling, the self-centered, the uppity, it's crazy how, like, we go back. We says in slavery times, guess what? We had to work alongside the, the men and do just as much, and then we come back to the house, and we are raped, and we are dehumanized even more, and, and uh, misog you know, just this whole misogynistic atmosphere that we're around. But then you want to sit and say that we're not ladies because, you know, the guy who did the speculum, Mr. Sims, said we don't feel pain. You know, we're this underrepresented minority, double minority. And so when you think about all that and you want to know why you can deem us as being arrogant and hard and controlling and self-centered and uppity. Well, I'm going to tell you this happened to me because I have so many job stories mm -hmm. um, where they were okay with laying me off. And my three kids having to find some way for me to take care of them and eat, but not okay with laying the white man off because he's got a family. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> he's got a family. Well, um, I'm going to put this little sidebar in there. If you guys haven't seen, have you seen the Cheesecake Girls? Mm -mm. They've been laid off, and they call them furlough Cheesecake. And so two black women who um, husbands, I think, are disabled and one girl is in co uh, one has a daughter in college and stuff. So in their furlough of being laid off, basically, by the government because it shut down, um, they started to cook in cheesecakes. And so they call them the furlough cheesecake. And they've been making money to help support themselves by starting this business. Oh, they're not um, bartering like the president said. Oh, you barter for your rent. Go mm -hmm. ahead, tell your landowner that you'll do some construction work and some. <laughs> <laughs> People don't want money. You see me. You see me. Who right? the hell? You how you me. gonna get paid? He, they the, sent out a note are, are you watching? telling I need people you how to barter I need you to see me. for your rent and your bills. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Okay. Oh, New going away. We'll is, touch that later. Do we have later. a democracy or is this a dictatorship? The, the girl, this okay. is a hard, hard right, mess. So All right, so conditions facing black women. First, our life, life expectancy is about 70 years. 
my grandma 85 gone girl Mine's is 86 about to be 87 yeah, gone, my girl. Grandma, and I bet all right that. that we have high effects of cancer heart, heart disease and obesity yeah that we are deleting in deaths for homicide between the ages of 18 and 34. 15, but go ahead. Sorry, 15 <laughs> and 34, yeah. And, and if then, I can see that. And, and then we serve as head of the household to 56% in 1990, in 1990 compared to 17% among white women and mostly living below the poverty line. So stop right there. And this is where I need our black men to step up. Mm -hmm. Because if we are in that position that mean white men are taking care of white women that's basically what it's saying right i agree no i'm saying that's what it's saying stepping up doing what you gotta do I and agree. and so black men that statistic is all on you okay i, I give it to them all right so you're making us out here being the breadwinners and taking care of your children hmm. Because we've been trying to hold you down because you have all these other things going on and then you taking advantage of us and having babies all over America and dehumanizing Well, women and, and not and being our advocates, what we talked about earlier about right. the black. They want us to advocate for you. And we need you to step up for us. Yes. And one of those is being in the home. Yeah, and not just there, present. Active, Financially, active, emotionally, yeah, and active physically. Active member of the home. Let's yeah. try that. Okay, and then ethnic prominence hypothesis. That means that racism is not sexism. So if it's a situation like Anita Hill, like the thing that happened with um, Mike Tyson and old girl, remember when he, he uh, Robin Givens, um, with R. Kelly, with those different things. When it's race over sex, they're going to take race. So mm -hmm. a lot of people will deal with the fact that, oh, these are black people, they're trying to hold them down before they would deal with the fact that women are being abused. Yeah. All right, so relationships. 10% of black women are divorced. 37% mm -hmm. never get married. Now, look at the three reasons why they say they never get married. High mm -hmm. number of incarcerated males. True. Those the who, system. Yeah, those males that live a gay lifestyle. And then those who prefer white women. So only 37% of, I mean, well, 37% of women, black women, never get married, ever. And I'm going to say they might be the lucky ones. <laughs> 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 and then the, the numbers is even slimmer, which means that more women are not getting married if you are highly educated and or, make you have, money. or you make, make money. money. And some of them would rather be educated and make money than deal with some of y'all. I'm well, just going to say. Wow. Well, well all preach. right. So let's talk a little bit about the mental health. So in 2000, there were over 34.7 million African-Americans in the United States, which make up about 13 percent of the population. OK, please say that again, because why people think we the, the majority. That's why they call us minority. Minorities. Yeah. We are the very small part of and the United States. And granted, this was 2000. It was 18 years ago. But, but the still, this the it might have went up 3%. 2000, yeah. Though. yeah, it may, or even down for that amount. Matter, yeah, I, I mean, know. give or take, but yeah. we're not 25% of the population. And let's be clear why a lot of that is, is so, okay? They have this, and I, dang it, okay, I got to find, all right, um, re read a little bit of that, and then I'll find what I'm, what I'm looking for to, to share with you with that. Almost 25% or 7.5 million African Americans have been diagnosed with a mental illness. African American women might be overrepresented, overrepresented in this population as they are at a higher risk for developing mental illness. And some of that mental illness deals with the fact that we take, we have a lot of risk factors, which include lower income, poor health, multiple role strain, and the double minority status of race and gender, being black and female. Older African American women might be at an additional risk because of the high prevalence of chronic disease in this population. Um, between the chronic disease and mental health issues such as depression, a national study conducted by the California Black Women's Health Project revealed that 60% of African-American women experience symptoms of depression. I'm one of them. Mm. Girl, depressed. Even so, the use of outpatient mental health services is lower for African-Americans. Even though we've been diagnosed, we ain't getting it, no help at all. Um, um, to white women and African American men even get more help than we do. We the bottom of the bottom. Yep. Hmm. Um, another study examined treatment seeking among adult African American women with panic disorders and found that only 13% sought treatment. Um, 
I'm in that 13% because I definitely have a panic disorder. Mm -hmm. You know I have anxiety all over the place. But um, I got medication. But um, most people don't. So tell me, why, why do you think it was misdiagnosed, your anxiety? It wasn't misdiagnosed. It was diagnosed. No, but you said, when, well, was late in being diagnosed. Um, because I didn't know what it was. I had no idea what it was. I've been having panic attacks since I was in high school, and I didn't know that it was panic attacks. Mm -hmm. I just didn't know what it was. Okay. Yeah, and it wasn't like every day. I might have a panic attack, you know, once or twice a year, but I didn't know what it was, and nobody else did either, you know. So I didn't have any guidance in that until I was 30. And it happened, and my cousin was like, you need to see somebody. Right. <laughs> and I went to the doctor. Okay, so, so here, here's happened. what I wanted to talk about. It, it's called bedroom politics, right? Mm -hmm. And it says the most outlandish, outlandish act of oppression in modern times is the current campaign to promote sterilization of non-white women in an attempt to maintain the population and power imbalance between white that whites have and non-whites have not. So basically, they in the United States, they so call it birth control and so we have all these planned parenthood and they're saying that it's surgical genocide and what they're saying is happening is they're holding these uh, they started this um surgi surgical operation called salpingectomy okay s-a-l-p-i-n-g-e-c-t-o-m-y and it was performed at a hospital under general anesthetic and what it does is this method of birth control was done in puerto rico so the, uh, Puerto, uh, Puerto Rico has long been used by the colonists, colonists, exploiters, the United States as a huge experimental laboratory for medical research before allowing certain practices to be imported and used here. When the birth control pill was first being perfected, it was tried out on a Puerto Rican women and select black women who were poor using them like guinea pigs to evaluate the effects and the efficiency. And then the, and then the white women reap the benefits mm -hmm. of being able to control mm -hmm. how many kids they wanted to have. Um, so, so what they did was in New York um, and in, I think it may have been Chicago, it was like five different cities, they started these little clinics, basically. Mm -hmm. And what they did was they told them that they, it was like a forced sterilization patients. And they were saying that, you know, if you wanted to continue to receive your services, be it if you were a woman who was poor and you needed to take care of your children, then mm -hmm. you would get these, um, these procedures. And so, again, it's S-A-L-P-I-N-G-E-C-T-O-M-Y, and it's Salpin ejectomy is what I'm going to say. And what they do through an ab abdominal incision, the surgeon cuts both fallopian tubes and tie off the separated ends after which there is no way the eggs can pass from the ovaries to the womb. And so they were saying, hey, if you want to do this and you want to keep your, you know, you can't keep having the children, don't come in here after you have four kids and think you're going to have a fifth one. If you want to keep your benefits, this is what you're going to do. So when you think about when you were talking about 13%, that's why I wanted to bring that up. And the number is probably more going down than going up because of that fact. Okay. Mm. All right. So that's mental illness. You talked about the financial yet? No. Okay. Centoya Brown. Uh-huh. We were talking about the fact that her case has been in the news. Um, she's been incarcerated since she was 16, mm -hmm. 15 years and we're talking about women being exploited. Right. And that's what happened to the system exploited her after the man exploited her. Right. At, and sex trafficking and prostituting her out. And then the system, after she kills her John, turns around and exploits her father. Right. Like, and, and, and getting her the help she needed mm -hmm. from the point where she felt like um, there was no way out. Right. So um, I, I feel like that's part of the mental health problem, too, for us, mm -hmm. is that we, it, it doesn't happen once or twice. You know, we, we get hit multiple times. That's true. With that's multiple true. systems. Well, and then when you Within add, our community. Yeah. Within finances, right. Judicial add, uh -huh. system, uh -huh. and ju finances. Yes. So we talked a little bit go. about finances, how black families um, have about $11,000 in net worth compared to their white counterparts that have mm -hmm. about 134000 So from 11000 to 134000 91000 for Asians, 14000 for Hispanics, and blacks are at 11000 Between 1992 and 2013, college-educated whites saw their wealth grow 86%, while college- <laughs> 
college educated blacks saw theirs plummet by 55 percent so you had all this debt because you went to school but you wasn't getting a job that was making you pay more that was helping you afford those student the loans student and all loans. that other stuff Isn't and live trust me i know Okay, so this only adds to the stress of black professional women who are often focused on maintaining equilibrium at home and in their communities. So they're trying to say, okay, I'm going out, I'm getting these degrees, I'm doing all this kind of stuff. But at the same time, I'm not getting paid. So now I'm frustrated. I have anxiety. I got depression. I, I got, got bills. I got oh mouths to feed. Everything that causes anxi anxiety that I can speak on for myself. Correct. The brain never stops when you know you got stuff that nothing, right. nothing's never done. And then they talk about how black women are not getting those CEO jobs or running or, or doing the things that they need to do in order to um, run big companies. And they're saying that a lot of times when you even get put in positions to be a manager over a smaller group of people, nobody ever gives you feedback. And guess why? Because they fear of litigation or they're afraid that you'll have some type of emotional reaction. Oh, 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 don't get all upset. Don't get upset. And, I and know, then I'm, we saw Brett Kavanaugh show his ass mm -hmm. on national TV. Now that and couldn't it, have been it, a it, sister, baby. Oh, but do you understand what up. I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We were saying if any female sister, yeah, that's any female mm -hmm. had acted like he did, mm -hmm. that nobody would be saying, oh, he did a great job or yeah. she did a great job. They'll all be talking about how negative Right. It was, but go ahead. So I do want to add this for black women. We often, often suffer from what is called emotional tax. Let me say it again. Emotional tax. And that is the burden of being on guard all the time and how it affects our lives in really negative ways. And so when you think of the angry black woman, nobody has ever said the angry white woman, which just... When you think of the angry black woman, when you think of the woman that's a bully, when you think of the woman, black woman who aggressive or all these other kind of things that you say and you think about everything we've talked about, the emotional tax on us from the, the married to the men we date to the men we raise to the people we work for, to the people we, we hire to work for us, or to the, the people, people we, we go to school with. with, to the people we work with. All these people are constantly taking these stereotypes and stuff and using it in a negative way against black women to the point where we're emotionally taxed. The burden of being on guard all the time and how it affects our lives in a negative way. So we just wanted to take this opportunity to share with you guys our hour is up. But we wanted to just sound the alarm and let you know that even in the situation with R. Kelly and how everybody is like going after these women, we need to take a step back, be more sensitive to the fact that look at how America looks at us as black women. Well, I want you to do one more thing for me is to look at your community. If you see a black girl that's being mistreated, I want you to not look away and be silent. I want you to actually get involved and involved in a way that protects our young girls and i'm not saying you got to move somebody in but mm -hmm. hey if you need to call the police call the police yeah. if you need to go to that child's parent because it's someone outside the home go to the parent right but what you don't need to do is be, be quiet silent. step up because it's, it's it's time out for black women to be invisible to be made, it, it, to be ridiculed, and that's for all females, but especially black women, because if you haven't listened to anything we said tonight, we've had a long, hard road. And in order to turn the tide, people got to start responding and we acting to us differently. Different. We're still on that road. And I'm talking about to the point where I can literally cry sometimes. I'm just well, like, we it's got, just crazy we got some good think. programs, Black Girl oh. Magic. We got Black Girls Rock. Yeah. We've got yeah. some other things for black girls that we really have to speak life into it. But you know what? We the need crazy to speak thing life about into it is, that. is that for all of the women, the Oprah Winfrey's, the Michelle Obama's, the Devin, um, Ava Devernay's, to all the women who, the um, Carrie Washington, to all the women who, are, who women are doing amazing things and are, are set and trailblazing, we need to make sure that we are, are not forgetting those who may not ever get that far, but still need our support. So when you see programs that come up to talk about how women have been abused the way R. Kelly has abused these women, don't talk about them. Support them. Be there for them. So from the outhouse to the penthouse, these two black are girls out. are out. Y'all have a great evening. Two different point of views with the same name. What they name is Keisha and Keisha. Keisha.
Keisha, 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 Keisha,